All right, my brethren, let's go to the book of Matthew, if you would, the Gospel of Matthew. Boy, he's excited about Children's Church. He wants you to know. Amen. We can get the adults as excited as the kids. Amen. We'll be all right. Amen. Matthew chapter 28. We got baptisms tonight. Baptisms tonight. You've been saved, but you haven't been baptized yet. You need to get baptized. I'm going to explain it to you why in just a minute. And if you're not saved, you can get saved this morning and then baptized tonight. Amen. Boy, that'd be wonderful, wonderful. Matthew chapter 28, let's talk about it. Matthew chapter 28, the Lord has risen again. But before He returns to heaven, He's giving His final instructions to His disciples. What is a disciple? A disciple is simply a follower. A disciple of Jesus Christ is a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ. And if you've been saved by the grace of God, you ought to be a disciple. You ought to be a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. And that means that you will follow Him in all the things that He instructs us to do in the Word of God, which includes baptism. And so here in Matthew chapter 28, <clears throat> the Lord gives to His disciples their final, His final instructions, and He gives to them what has become known as the Great Commission. He says in Matthew chapter 28, verse number 18, And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations. That's why we support missionaries. Amen. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. Let's talk about the doctrine of water baptism this morning. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for your goodness. Lord, we thank you for the privilege to be in church. What a privilege it is, Father. Now, Father, we recognize that all of our efforts would be in vain unless the Holy One comes down, the Holy Spirit, to minister to our needs, to speak to our hearts as only He can through your Word. Father, if there be anyone here this morning that does not know Jesus Christ as his or her personal Savior. I pray for Holy Ghost conviction. I pray, dear God, that you would deal with that individual in a mighty way this morning. I pray, dear Father, that you would bring that, that one to salvation, that today would be their day of salvation. And for those who are saved, help us, Father, to be obedient, to the instructions of thy word. Now, Father, I pray that in this moment you would give me the words to speak, that you would speak through your servant, and that you would minister to us. We need you, Lord, more than we need anything else. We pray, Father, that you would be glorified and that Jesus Christ would be exalted. In his name we pray, amen. amen. I don't have time to say everything that could be said about baptism. As a matter of fact, uh, in the Word of God, you'll find that there's more than one kind of baptism. There's actually seven different kinds of baptisms, and we just don't have the time uh, in this one message this morning to get into all of them. But I'll just go ahead and mention them. There's seven different types of baptisms in the Bible. There's a baptism unto Moses, mentioned in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 1 and 2. There's a baptism of repentance by John the Baptist, mentioned in Matthew chapter 3, verses 1 through 6. There's the baptism of the Jewish believers with the Holy Ghost, mentioned in Matthew 3.11 and Acts 2.38. There's the baptism of fire, mentioned in Matthew 3.11. There's a baptism of suffering, mentioned in Matthew 20, verse 22, and Luke 12, verse 50. 
There's a baptism by the Holy Spirit into the body of Christ, mentioned in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 13. And then there's the baptism that we're going to discuss this morning, known as water baptism for the new believer. And we just read about that right here in Matthew chapter number 28. So what about this baptism? Let's talk about water baptism for the new believer. If you'll go to Acts chapter number 8, in Acts chapter 8 we find an example of someone that got baptized. And as we read the story, we'll get questions answered concerning the subject of baptism. There's a lot of questions. There's a lot of debate. <clears throat> there's a lot of controversy concerning the subject of baptism. Now, we're a Baptist church. Welcome to Calvary Baptist Church. Now, what does that necessarily mean? What that means is that we believe in baptism. That's why we're going to do some tonight. And, uh, but what about baptism is it that we believe? There's a lot of things that people believe about baptism, and not all of it is correct. And so as a Bible-believing church, we want to go to the Word of God, and we want to make sure that everything that we say and do is in line with the instructions of God's Word. Amen. More than anything else, we're a Bible-believing church. Amen. We believe the Bible is the Word of God. We believe the King James Bible is the infallible, inspired, inerrant Word of God. And we believe that it is the final authority in, in, in all that we say and do, in all matters of faith and practice, as they say. And so, what does the Bible have to say concerning water baptism? Now, here in Acts chapter number 8, the question was asked by someone uh, as to why or um, why or or when could he be baptized? Let's look at it in Acts chapter 8, look at verse 26. Acts chapter 8, And the angel of the Lord spake unto Philip, saying, Arise and go toward the south unto the way that goeth down from Jerusalem unto Gaza, which is desert. And he arose and went. And behold, a man of Ethiopia, an eunuch of great authority under Candace, queen of, Eth of the Ethiopians, who had the charge of all her treasure and had come to Jerusalem for to worship. So this was a very important individual. And in verse 28, he was returning, the Bible says, and sitting in his chariot, read, the, read Isaiah the prophet, or Isaiah. Then the Spirit said unto Philip, Go near and join thyself to this chariot. Go near and join thyself to this chariot. And Philip ran thither, to him. That's how you respond to the Holy Spirit. Immediately. Amen. If the Holy Spirit speaks to your heart today, that's how you ought to respond. I tell you, uh, uh, if, if an altar calls a uh, given, you ought to run to it. Amen. Amen. You ought to respond. Uh, uh, listen, the Bible says, Boast not thyself of tomorrow, for thou knowest not what a day may bring forth. One of the biggest problems that we have as Americans, okay, is this problem called procrastination procrastination. You don't want to procrastinate too much when it comes to your salvation Amen. because there's eternal consequences for that mistake. And so, but same thing goes for the Christian. You need to respond when the Lord tells you, when he gives you a task to do, when he tells you to do something, you ought to respond immediately, not in a convenient time. Too many Christians are looking for a convenient season to serve God. When everything is okay, when, my, when I got my finances straight, then I'll serve God. Or when I've got some things in order back at the house, then I'll do what God wants me to do. No, listen, the time to obey the will of God for your life is right now. Not tomorrow, not next year, not when you've got uh, everything straightened out that you would like to get straightened out. No, you need to be doing what you can right now to do God's will for your life. Amen. God is, listen, God is worthy of your faithfulness right now, not next year. Amen. Amen. The time to do right is now. The time to get right is now. Amen. The time to repent of that sin in your life is today, right now. Right. Amen. And so the Bible says, uh, where are we in Acts chapter number 8? And look at verse number 30. And Philip ran thither to him and heard him read the prophet Isaiah and said, Understandest thou what thou readest? And he said, How can I except some man should guide me? And he desired Philip. Look at the sincerity of this Ethiopian eunuch. He desired Philip that he would come up and sit with him. 
The place of the scripture which he read was this. He was led as a sheep to the slaughter, and like a lamb dumb before his shearer, so open he not his mouth and his humiliation. His judgment was taken away, and who shall declare his generation, for his life is taken from the earth. This was a reference to the Lord Jesus Christ himself. When John the Baptist introduced Jesus Christ to the nation of Israel, he said, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. There's only one mediator between God and man, and it's not the Pope. And it's not the Virgin Mary. And it's not the Baptist preacher. It's the man Christ Jesus. Why? Because he's the only man that was ever born of a virgin. He's the only man that walked upon this sin-cursed earth perfectly and without sin. He was the only man that sacrificed his life on the cross of Calvary and shed his divine blood that could wash away your sins. And he was the only man that three days later he rose from the dead by his own power. That gives him the right to be the savior of the world. I'm telling you, Jesus, when he rose again from the dead, he proved once and for all that Jesus Christ is everything that he said that he ever was. You say, I don't believe in the resurrection. Well, go find his bones. Just as soon as you can find them, you'll have something to say. But until then, you're just going to have to accept the fact that Jesus Christ was God, is God, manifested in the flesh. He's the Savior of the world. He rose again from the dead. Why? Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. The Bible says, uh, listen, that those that are lost, in Ephesians chapter 2, he says that you're dead. You're dead in trespasses and sins. If you're not saved this morning, you are dead spiritually. But we have a God in heaven who sent his only begotten son, Jesus Christ, to, to, to sacrifice his life for your sins, that he might be the resurrection and life for you. Jesus Christ is not just something that we have on the side or something that we observe on Sunday morning. No, Jesus Christ deserves to be your life. He is the life. He's the way, the truth, and the life. He wants to be your life and give you eternal life. Amen. Amen. And so the Bible says here in verse number 34, And the eunuch answered Philip and said, I pray thee, of whom speaketh the prophet this, or of, uh, of himself <clears throat> or of some other man? Then Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. That's how to preach. Just open up the scriptures and then open your mouth about what that thing says. Verse 36, and as they went on their way, they came unto a certain water. And the eunuch said, see, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? Now, that's a good question. Very good question. Here's water. We got water back here. We got water, or we're going to have it. When are we going to? You're going to fill that thing up this afternoon, right? Well, we got a baptismal pool right here. What hinders you to be from being baptized? We got three that have decided that they need to be baptized because they've trusted the Lord Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. What about you? Have you been baptized? If you haven't, why not? And when are you going to do it? And so let's talk about it. Uh, this was a good question. What is it that hinders me? What's keeping me uh, from being baptized? When can I do that? Now, the Bible says in Acts chapter 8, verse 37. Now, make sure you have a King James Bible, because if you don't have a King James Bible, you're not going to have this verse. And that's a shame, because here's the answer to his question. In Acts chapter 8, uh, verse 37, And Philip said, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. The only thing keeping you back from being baptized is getting saved. And the way you get saved is by faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Faith and trust in what Jesus did for you on the cross of Calvary. But the problem with the religious is that they're trusting in something else other than Jesus Christ in order to be saved. Yeah, bro, yeah. Listen, uh, there's, it's one thing to be religious, but it's another thing to be born again. Amen. And the two are not necessarily the same. You can be religious and yet lost. Paul the Apostle was religious. He was a Pharisee. He was a member of the, of the most strictest uh, uh, religious sect 
of his day, and yet he was still lost because he didn't know Jesus Christ as his personal Savior. Do you know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior? There's a difference between knowing someone and really knowing someone. I know about President Donald Trump. I know who he is. I know that he exists. I know a lot of things about him, but I don't know him personally. And you may know a lot of things about Jesus Christ, but do you have a personal relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ? Can you honestly say that the Lord Jesus Christ lives in my heart? I commune with him. I fellowship with him. I walk with him. He's my savior and he's my friend. Do you commune with him? Do you have a relationship with Jesus Christ? If not, you need to be saved. And I'm here to tell you, Jesus Christ loves you, and Jesus Christ wants to have a personal relationship with you. Now, that's something way different than religion. Religion is a whole bunch of do's and don'ts. It's a system. But we're not here to offer you a system this morning. We're here to point you to the Lord Jesus Christ. And so he asked, he asked a good question. He said, what doth hinder me to be baptized? And he answered him. He said, if thou believest, verse 37, with all, notice, if thou believest, notice, with all thine heart, with all thine heart. What does that mean? That means that you're going to put everything you have, your faith and your trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. It's a commitment. It's a decision. It's a confidence. It's trust. One of the best illustrations I ever had of, 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 of faith, in my opinion, for me, that made, that made it uh, make sense for me, what true faith really is, was uh, a time that my father and I was doing a job on Paris Island. We had the contract to install the, the tile flooring in, in the uh, many different buildings there on Paris Island many, many years ago. And I'll never forget that my, my dad, we had installed the tiles, but there was this section of the floor that was really messed up. And it was so problematic, it was so messed up, that we had to rip them tiles back up so we can redo it, do it all over again. And uh, I, I'll never forget, my dad was ripping them tiles up. He's here this morning. That's, the pro that's what you get for being related to the preacher. You always get to be a part of his illustrations. And so... He's ripping his towels up and he's visibly frustrated. And I'll never forget the supervisor walked up to my father and he put his hand on his shoulder. And he said, hey, Mike, he said, he said, listen, calm down, Mike. Don't worry about it. Listen, we knew that this floor was going to be a problem. That's why we hired you. We could have hired a whole bunch of other people, but we hired you because we believe you're the best around. And so we hired you to deal with this because we figured if anyone was going to solve this problem, it'll be, uh, it'll be Mike. So listen, uh, don't worry about it. Don't get too frustrated. He said, the, la the next thing he said, I, we have faith in you, is what he said. And I'll never forget when he, when he said those words. I, I took note of it, and it forever became an illustration whenever I want to illustrate to people what faith is. What was he saying when he said, I have faith in you? You see, you, you can, faith has an action to it. Faith is something that's proven. You can say that you believe that he can do the job, but that faith will never be proven until you can demonstrate it. Go ahead and hire the guy if you really believe that he can do it. He hired the guy, and then even when there were problems involved, he, his faith never wavered. He still believed if anybody can get the job done, it's this guy. That's true faith. And see, the problem with religion, religion is not true faith. Because religion says, here's what you need to do to be saved. You need to do a bunch of sacrifice, sacraments. Or you need to be a good person. Or you need to trust in something else. You need to trust in yourself or in your abilities. That's not true faith. When you put your faith in Jesus Christ, you're taking the matter out of your hands. That supervisor took the matter out of his hands. They could have done it. You know, he had his own crews. They had their own construction crews, but he hired us to do it. Why? Because he obviously he didn't have faith in his own crews, but he had faith in us. So he put us to the job. When you're ready to have faith in Jesus Christ. See, the reason why some of you have not gotten saved is because you still think that you can solve your own problems. 
The reason why some of you have not gotten saved, and listen, I love every one of you, but listen to me. I just want to help you this morning. Listen, uh, uh, the reason why some of you have still not gotten saved is because you, st you still don't realize how much you need Jesus Christ. You think that you can do it yourself. You think that you can solve your own issues. You think that you've got the answers. But until you realize that only Jesus Christ, until you realize that there are things that only God can do, when you're ready to take the matter of your life out of your hands and put it in the hands of Jesus Christ, then you'll be ready to be saved. Amen. That's real faith. Real faith says, I'm going to put my whole trust, my whole commitment, everything that I believe, I'm going to put it in you. I'm going to put it in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. Not in my religion, not in my good works, not in the system that I'm uh, working my way through, this 10-step program. No, sir, neither baptism. I'm only, the only thing I'm going to put my faith and trust in is the Lord Jesus Christ. That's salvation. So baptism doesn't say he said, what doth hinder me to be baptized? Notice he didn't say, let's do it right now. No, he said, first, before we do it, you need to trust Jesus Christ. You need to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. When did you put your faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ for the salvation of your soul? When did you do that? And if you cannot point back to a time in your life, when you put your faith and trust 100% in the Lord Jesus Christ for the salvation of your soul, let me tell you something, that's a good indication that you still need to be saved. Amen. If you, can you point back to the moment when you realize I need to repent of what I am, of who I am, and I need to quit trusting in myself. I need to quit trusting in my, in the religion of mommy and daddy. I need to quit trusting in everything else. I need to put all of my faith and all of my trust in Jesus Christ. When did you do that? And if you haven't done that, we invite you to do it this morning. Amen. You can be saved today. You can be saved today. Uh, so what is the requirement for baptism? Salvation. There are those that teach that baptism is what saves. It's what the Church of Christ believes. The Church of Christ believes that when you get baptized, now I'm going to explain in a minute what baptism is. We're going to put you, we're going to totally immerse you in the water and then pull you right back up. Okay, so uh, what is the purpose of, of that? We're going to discuss in just a minute. But there are those that teach that once you get, once you are uh, submerged into that water, that you come in contact with the Holy Spirit and the blood of Jesus Christ. But that's baloney. That's not what the Bible teaches. No, sir. You come in contact with the faith, with the blood of Jesus Christ, the very moment that you repent and put your faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. And the proof that salvation comes before baptism is found in the book of Luke. Look at it. Look at the book of Luke, chapter 23. <clears throat> and I know some that can argue about whether this is dispensationally correct and all of this. I promise you that it is. And I don't have time to get into all of that. But look at Luke, chapter number 23. Luke, chapter number 23. Look at verse 39. Luke 23, 39. And one of the malefactors which were hanged railed on him, saying, If thou be Christ, save thyself and us. Now, I don't have time to get into it, but if you study the four Gospels, you'll find there were two thieves that were crucified. On e there was one on each side of Jesus Christ. Jesus in the middle, there was a thief to his left, and there was a thief to his right. And you'll find in the Gospels that in the beginning, as they hung on that cross, both of those thieves blasphemed the Lord Jesus Christ. But a, a few minutes later, something changes. All of a sudden, one of those thieves, uh, one of those thieves starts changing his tune. Look at Luke, look at Luke chapter number 23. Look at verse number 39. <clears throat> one of the male factors, which were hanged, railed on him, saying, If thou be Christ, save thyself and us. And the other answering rebuked him, saying, Notice, the other thief. Answering rebuked him, saying, Dost thou not, does not thou fear God? seeing thou art in the same condemnation. And we indeed justly, listen, you're never going to get saved until you realize that you're guilty of being a sinner. 
The Bible says, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. But the reason why some sinners, many sinners, don't get saved is because they still think that they're better than everybody else or than other people. Maybe not everybody else, but they still think that they're better than somebody else. And until you come to the same conclusion that the Apostle Paul came to, what did he say? He said, I was the chiefest of sinners. Amen. And you know what? Until you get to the point where you see yourself as worse than everybody else. But that's the problem. When you have pride, that pride blinds you. It's hard to see yourself as worse than that drug addict down there on the streets. I witnessed to a drug addict just last Wednesday night. And I told her, you want to know the only difference between you and I? The only difference between you and I is that Jesus saved me. Because was it not for that, there's a very good chance I'd be right down on the streets doing the same thing you're doing. But thank the Lord, he saved me. That's the only difference between us two. The only difference is not that I'm better, I made better decisions, although there are people that do make better decisions. But whether you make better decisions or not, listen, your heart, the Bible says, is still desperately wicked. You're worse than you can even imagine. And until you're willing to see just how bad off you really are. And listen, listen, let's make believe you are better than some other people. Even though you're not, because there's none righteous, no, not one, the Bible says. But let's just say that you are a little bit better than that bum that you look down your nose on on the street. What if you are better than him, than that drug addict or that drunkard or that one that's down and out? What if you are better than them? Let me tell you something. It doesn't matter anyways, because if you die lost, having never trusted Jesus Christ as your personal savior, you're still going to go to hell. And guess what? When you go to hell... It doesn't matter anymore how good you were back on the earth. You're still in hell. If you die lost, you will go to hell and you'll burn in hell right alongside the wickedest and evilest murderers that ever lived. And the reason why you'll be there is because you rejected Jesus Christ because you refused to repent of the sinner that you are. You got too busy and too distracted comparing yourself with everyone else that you felt was worse than you. And it robbed you from being able to see things clearly, from being able to see the spiritual need that you have to repent of the sinner that you are to be saved. All right. And so uh, we, we're talking about baptism this morning. But look at Luke chapter 23. Look at verse number 40, 41. We indeed justly, notice, he admits his guilt. We receive the due reward of our deeds. But this man have done nothing amiss. In order to be saved, you must recognize who you are, what you are, and then you must recognize who Jesus is. Amen. He's perfect. He's the son of God. He's the solution. And then look at verse number 42. And he said unto Jesus, Lord, I love that part. Why do the new Bibles take that word out? You realize that the new versions, they take out the word Lord. Now, you, you think about how wicked that is. I like what one, a Mexican preacher said one time. He said, why is it when they want to take words out of the Bible, it's always the name of Jesus? Why don't they take the name of Satan out? He said, if you're going to take anything out of the Bible, I'd rather you take the devil out. Why is it always my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ? Hey, I love Jesus. Leave him in there. They take, think about it. Think about how wicked it is to change the Bible. They take the word Lord out of the Bible. Do you realize, my brethren, here's Jesus Christ. They've plucked his beard off. They've stuck a, a spear into his side. They're mocking him. They, they're spitting in his face. They're ridiculing him. They're treating him like a criminal, unjustly. He never did anything wrong. All he ever did was feed people and do miracles to heal people and help people. And this is the way they repay him. Do you realize that the only positive thing Jesus heard while he was on the cross was, Lord, and yet that's the one thing they take out? How wicked is that? But notice this dying thief, he recognized this man that's hanging between us. He is the Lord. And until you recognize who Jesus Christ is, you're never going to get saved. The Bible says in verse 42, he said unto Jesus, Lord, remember me. When thou comest into thy kingdom. Now look at verse 43. And this should end all arguments about whether or not. See, we can, dis, we, can, we can spend all day discussing all the different things that people debate about concerning baptism. 
But for me, this ought to clear all of it up in this one verse of scripture. Look at it. In verse number, uh, verse number 43, Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, notice, Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. Here's a question. When did that dying thief get baptized? He didn't. He got saved on the cross and then died right there on the cross. He got saved right before he died. But when did he get baptized? When did he join the local church? When did he begin tithing? <laughs> huh? When did he join the 12-step soul winning program down at the church? He didn't do any of that. You know what? Salvation is by grace through faith in the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, plus nothing, minus nothing. Amen. You don't need to be baptized to be saved. But why do we baptize? You don't get baptized to get saved. You get baptized because you're already saved. The dying thief didn't have a chance to get baptized because he was on a cross. But at the very least, he got saved. Amen. And listen, you don't know when your time is. That's why the Bible says, boast not thyself of tomorrow, for thou knowest not what a day may bring forth. You, you can die before you leave the church parking lot. You can get in a car accident on your way home after services this morning and die instantly in a car accident. It happens every day. Are you ready? If you're not ready, we've got good news for you. Jesus Christ is available this, this morning to change your life forever if you'll let him. Amen. And so we see the dying thief. Notice the proper mode. I want you to notice the mode of baptism. Look at Acts chapter 8. I'm hurrying. But stay with me now. Acts chapter 8. Acts chapter 8. What's the proper mode of water baptism? Here's something else that people discuss and argue about. Now, we're going to have baptisms tonight. We're going to fill up this baptismal pool with, with water. And we're going to submerge them completely in the water. But we won't keep them there too long. Don't worry. I'm going to bring you back up. Now, why do we do it that way? Because there's other places where they just sprinkle the water on you. But notice how they did it in Acts chapter 8. We're Bible believers. We want to do it the way they did it in the word of God. So in Acts chapter number 8, look at verse 38. Acts chapter 8, verse 38. And he commanded the chariot to stand still. And notice, they went down both into, into, notice, into the water. They went down both into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized them. And then verse 39, and when they were come up, notice, out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught away Philip, that the eunuch saw him no more, and he went on his way rejoicing. Notice. They went into the water and then they came out of the water. Now, why do we do it that way? Because baptism symbolizes something. Come to the book of Romans chapter 6, if you will. And like I said, we don't have the time to get into all of the verses. I wish we did, but let's at least look at some of them. Look at Romans chapter 6. Now, in Romans chapter 6, remember what I said in the beginning. There's more than one type of baptism in the Bible. Do not make the mistake that some people do. In thinking that every time the word baptism shows up, it's referring to the same thing. You must learn to study, read and study your Bible within its context. The context will tell you if it's talking about something physical or spiritual. If it, the context will determine what type of baptism it is. Now in Romans chapter 6, it's talking about something spiritual. A baptism that the Holy Spirit does. Because, because water baptism symbolizes something that already took place in your heart. Again, I'm not get, we're not getting baptized. These young ladies that will be getting baptized tonight, they're not getting baptized to be saved. They're getting baptized because they say that they have already been saved. Therefore, what that means is God has already begun to do a work in their heart. Water baptism is just going to be an outward expression of something that has already happened on the inside. Amen. Let's look at it. In Romans chapter 6. Talking about a different type of baptism. But in these verses it reveals to us. What, the, what baptism symbolizes. Look at Romans chapter number 6. Look at verse 3. Know ye not that so many of us. As were baptized into Jesus Christ. Were baptized into his death. Now that's a spiritual baptism. That happened when you got saved. 
Verse 4, therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death. And uh, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. So notice, we, he mentions the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's what baptism sim symbolizes. When we baptize these, these new converts tonight, we're going to put them into the water. Why? When they go down, that's going to symbolize burial. Why? Because the, they're not the same person that they were before. One, one of the people getting baptized tonight is my beautiful niece, Madison. There she is over there. Now, Madison, in a revival meeting down in Florida, went forward one night and trusted Jesus Christ as her personal Savior. She called on the Lord and asked God to save her. In that moment, in that moment, according to the word of God, the Holy Spirit put her into Jesus Christ. Amen. So she's already saved. So what that means is the moment she got saved, she became a different person. She's not the same Madison that she was the day before. Now, that doesn't mean that she's perfect. Some people teach that. That's incorrect. Christians are not perfect, but they are different. There's something different about it. There's something different about you when you get saved. You can still make mistakes because we still have this flesh to deal with. I give the illustration all the time. Before I got saved, I liked to eat hamburgers and hot dogs and pork chops and fried chicken. I still do. Even after I got saved. Why? Because the flesh hasn't changed. The appetites of the flesh haven't changed. Well, then what's the difference if you got saved? The difference is that when I got saved, somebody moved on the inside. Amen. And when that individual moved on the inside, he gave me new desires. I may have had an appetite for certain things before that were wrong. But guess what? Now I have some new appetites. Now all of a sudden, I want to read the Bible. I didn't desire that before. Now all of a sudden, something tells me I need to go to church. Amen. Now all of a sudden, something, something tells me I shouldn't talk that way. I shouldn't act that way. I shouldn't behave that way. Something on the inside now tells me that I need to do things differently. The Bible says, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things will become new or become new. Now, here's the thing. This flesh hasn't changed. But one of these days it will. Amen. One of these days we're going to see the Lord Jesus Christ face to face. And in that moment in the future, the Lord is going to transform this, this fleshly body and give us a glorified body. Then we'll be perfect when we're up there. Amen. But for right now, we struggle with this flesh. But brother Manny, then what's the difference? Why should I get saved if the flesh doesn't change? Because what God changes in your life is not the outside. What God changes is on the inside. And when God changes you on the inside, he gives you the power by the presence of the Holy Spirit on the inside to overcome sin and to have the victory over any problem or issue in life. Amen. That's why you want to get saved so that God can give you the power that you need to overcome the things that you cannot overcome being a lost individual. Amen. Now look at the Bible. We're almost done. Notice, he says, uh, you must raise in newness of life. So we're going to put him under the water. That's going to typify burial. When she got saved, that, uh, a death took place. The old Madison died. The old, where's Cheyenne at? Where are you at, Cheyenne? Don't be hiding. The old Cheyenne died when she got saved. And when she comes up out of the water, that's going to symbolize that when she got saved, a resurrection took place as well. Remember what I said earlier, in, I believe in Sunday school hour, if you're lost, the Bible says you're dead in trespasses and sins. When you get saved, God gives you life on the inside. Amen. It's spiritual. It's called eternal life. It will last forever. Amen. That's why we believe once saved, always saved. And that's a whole nother topic. But he gives you eternal life. So when we put them under the water, that's going to typify death and burial. The death and burial of Jesus Christ. But then we're going to bring them out of the water. And that's going to sim symbolize the resurrection of Jesus Christ. But not only the death, burial, resurrection of Jesus Christ. 
also the death, burial, and resurrection of the Christian. Because the Bible says you ought to walk in newness of life. Isn't it good to be saved this morning? All right. So let's close with this. Let me say one more thing and we'll be done. What does baptism do for us? You know what baptism is? It's an identification. It's an identification. You know, nowadays there's all this talk about uh, I, I identify as this. I don't identify as a man anymore. I want to be a woman. Why? What is wrong with you? I don't want to get pregnant. I leave that to them. But that's what's going on these days. I don't identify as a boy. I identify as a girl. I don't identify as a girl. I want to be a boy. I don't identify as this or that. I don't, uh, I don't identify as this race. Yeah, but you were born a Puerto Rican. Well, now I identify as Chinese. What gives you the right to identify as that? Because I just want to be identified as that. You know what you're doing when you get baptized? You're identifying yourself as a Christian. Amen. You're letting this world know, you know what? I'm not ashamed of Jesus Christ. Amen. Hey, listen, if this lost world is not ashamed to identify as stuff that God didn't even make him, then you surely ought not to be ashamed of identifying to this lost and dying world. Hey, guess what? I'm a Christian. Amen. I love Jesus Christ. Amen. There's no reason to be ashamed of Jesus Christ. Why would you be ashamed of Jesus Christ considering all that he's done for you? You was lost and undone and on your way to a devil's hell. But one day God sent the gospel your way and you put your faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. And God forgave you of your sins. And God changed you. And God lifted you up out of the miry clay and set your foot upon a rock. God put Jesus Christ in your heart and gave you something worth living for. Amen. Why would you be ashamed of that? Amen. If the world is not ashamed of being wicked and ungodly and perverted, we that have been saved by the grace of God ought not to be ashamed to let this lost and dying world know that Jesus Christ is the Lord. Amen. So when you get baptized tonight, you're identifying yourself. You're letting this, world, this whole world know. I don't care who knows about it. I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Amen. For it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth. Amen. I'll close there. Heads bowed, eyes closed. Let's all stand. We'll have a word of prayer in just a minute. But let me ask you a question. Have you been saved? It's a whole lot more that we could say, but if you have any questions, I'll be more than happy to answer your questions. As a matter of fact, I'm going to be speaking with some folks afterwards about some things. If you'd like some questions answered, I'll do my best to give you all the time that you need. But let me ask you a question. When did you get saved? Heads bowed, eyes closed. I want to give you an invitation to get saved this morning. But before I do, are you willing to admit that you need to be saved? Is there anyone here this morning that's willing to tell me, Brother Manny, pray for me. I need to be saved. I'm willing to admit that I've never trusted Jesus Christ as my personal Savior. Would you at least pray for me? If you'll raise your hand, I'll pray for you. And better yet, if you've never been saved by the grace of God, why don't you just come forward? We've got plenty of people here that know the Lord that would be more than happy to open a Bible and pray with you and show you from the Bible how you can be saved by the grace of God. Why don't you come forward? If you'll come forward and kneel right here in the front, someone will pray with you and show you from the Bible how you can call upon the name of the Lord and be saved today. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now let me ask you another question. You can look ahead. Have you been saved, but you have not yet been baptized? Why don't you come forward? If you, Madison, why don't you come forward? And Cheyenne, who, who else? If you've been saved this morning, I want you to come forward right here. I know it's going to be nervous. 
and embarrassing, but you've been saved by the grace of God. Come on forward. Come on. Amen. All right. You've been saved, but you have yet to follow the Lord in believer's baptism. I want you guys to line up right here so that everyone can come see who you are. And then after we say the last amen, we're going to have everyone come up and, and hug your neck and shake your hand and give you a word of encouragement. But these are new converts. These are some that have trusted the Lord Jesus Christ, but they have yet to be baptized, okay? So it is our responsibility as the church of Jesus Christ to give them the right hand of fellowship, to pray for them, to encourage them in their spiritual growth. And baptism, something else I didn't get time, have the time to get into, but baptism is the first step of obedience in the life of a Christian. 3,000 were saved on the day of Pentecost. What did they do immediately? They were all baptized on the same day. Amen. And so these have said that they've trusted Christ as their Savior, and now they want to follow the Lord in believer's baptism. What a blessing. Amen. What a blessing. We'll have baptism tonight, and we'll go ahead and close in a word of prayer. Is there anyone else? Now, if you're not saved, you can get saved today, and we'll add you to the list for tonight. Is there anyone else that needs to be baptized? Is there anyone else... You have been saved and you have been baptized, but you still don't have a church that you're a member of and you'd like to be a member of this church. Is there anyone like that this morning? You're, you will, you're, you're ready. You've already thought it through. You've already prayed about it. And you've got peace in your heart. Now, if you're considering it and you'd like to talk to me, come see me after services or whenever, whenever, throughout the week, and I'll be more than happy to talk to you about it. All right. And I'll show you from the Bible why if you're saved, you ought to be a member of a Bible believing church. You need that for your spiritual growth. I know it's not the only thing you need, but it's definitely one of the things you need for your spiritual growth. All right. What a blessing to have folks that want to get back follow the Lord and believe his baptism. Amen? Amen. All right. Let's close with a word of prayer. And then uh, we'll see you tonight at six o'clock. Brother Kenny's going to get the baptismal pool filled up. We'll have baptisms. After the message tonight, please be here tonight. I've got a message that the Lord has put on my heart that I want to share with you tonight. All right, let's close with a word of prayer, and we'll see you tonight at 6. Brother Jim Van Dam, please pray for us. Lord, thank you for your service. Thank you for these new brothers and sisters in Christ. Uh, help us and guide us tonight, following them through with their uh, baptism. We love you and thank you for all you do. Thank you most of all, Lord, for forgiving us of your, yes. our sins by shedding your precious blood. Amen. Amen. Come forward and give them the right hand of fellowship.